Hey everybody, welcome back to 10% True. I don't monetize this channel, so there's no advertising. And all I ask for in exchange is for you to like the video, drop a comment, and maybe even share it with your friends. And if you do like what you see or what you're hearing, feel free to subscribe and hit the bell button so you get notified of the next episode. Enjoy. Parker, welcome back to 10th Century. Good to see you. Thanks a lot for your time again. After that marathon, see how let's try one more time. <laughs> people are going to see part two and think another three well, hours. People want me nodding off and their head bouncing around and shit. <laughs> We're going to try and keep this to 45 minutes to, to the relief of those who are short on time. Although I will say, um, yeah. Parker, the feedback to this first part has been phenomenal, just like it was when oh, we good. did Oh, good. People were watching it. Yeah, yeah. They are, and they're learning from it, and they're enjoying good. it. You managed to combine those two things into one, which is a bit of a talent. So thank you. Good. Good. Today, then, or this evening, what we're doing is we're going to talk a little bit about your philosophy behind what you did with the gorillas when you took over. Because when we were talking before we hit record, we had sort of agreed that we'd gone through quite a few bits of detail around what you did and, and how you handled you know, whether or not you, you're going to be popular or, or unpopular in your pursuit of this greatness and, and you know, what your leadership was like at that time and, and how you were protected and, you know, if people were running interference, how you dealt with that. Um, but we didn't really start with the big picture. So let's do that. What was your philosophy when you took over the squadron? Okay, I when I went to, when I took over the 58th, uh, the first 30 days of the squadron, when I was the commander, I... Uh, flew with every member in the unit that were active. I call them OGs, original gorillas. I flew with every one of them. We flew a BFM sortie, 1v1 BFM sortie. The ops officer, he would come to me and say, you know, you've been here a while. I mean, you've gone to ever meet and have a pilot meeting and everything. And, and I said, oh, I'll have one when I'm ready. But just, you know, whatever. So I flew with all 30 of them, or however many there were at the time of the OGs. And when I was done, I decided to have a pi our first pilot meeting. And it was on a Friday afternoon, you know, kind of a beer thing where they could bring a beer in there and sit down and drink. And what I did was I said, okay, uh, how many of y'all really, really, really want to be good at 15 guys? And they're all, oh, yeah, raising their hand and stuff. And I go, that's good. I don't. I want to be the best F-15 pilot. Okay. Good is not good enough for me. If we have somebody in this unit that is weak in BFM or they're weak in uh, radar employment, targeting, uh, missile employment, you know, because we track them off the tape. And this month, so-and-so was the best with AIM-7s, you know, which means everybody else was somewhat weak. If you're happy with that, I'm not. Because if we have one member this week, we're all weak. If we have one member that, uh, and you as a team have to fix that because it's a team effort. You know, we can't do this by ourselves. When we step on the ladder, it's a team effort. Everybody has to play together. Everybody knows their role. And we can't accept that, well, the number four guy is not very good. And it's not my job to walk around this hall and do that. It's you guys. If you want to be good, just keep on pressing on like you're pressing on. But if you want to be the best, it's up to you guys. It's not up to me. And that means um, everything. I'm not going to walk around here and tell you, get your damn haircut. You're over 21. You know the rules and regs. Don't, I'm not going to tell you, shine your damn boots. That's up to you guys. I expect you guys to police yourselves and each other as a team and make yourselves the best. If you want to do that, I'm going to give you the assets to train against. And as you get more and more and better and better, I'm going to increase 
what we're doing. We're going to be gone a little bit more. We're going to no, 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 until you just call time out. But if you don't, I'm just going to keep making it harder. But it's up to you people to make it the best. And when I say you people, not only the pilot group, but every enlisted and every officer who wore a 58 patch was a member of that team. And I want to hear from every one of them. But I'm not going to do it. It's up to you. And, and that, that's basically what I told them. And I said, so it's up to you. You know, right now, I'm the best. I'm happy. It's your turn. And that's, that's how we did it. How did you measure then the, the progress that they were making if you were going to? Their reputation that, you know, people were giving them. And, I, and, and it was, you know, I was always told them about being humble and being approachable, but just be the best you can be. And when you step on that ladder and you strap that equipment on, you have to want to win. You can't have any doubt in your mind. And um, I just felt like I could give them more and more and more until I saw failure. And I told them two things. I said, one, don't ever lie to me. If you lie to me, mm, that's ugly. And don't embarrass me. Because if you embarrass me, that's going to be ugly. And they embarrassed me one time. One time. And that was at Nellis when I made them take off the patch and start, let's start all over again. Make it right. But so they learned. But I said, it's up to you all. You can take your, you can be the best and have a reputation for the rest of your lives, or you can be good. It's up to you. I know where I am, but it's up to you. Having talked, Paco, then in the, our last conversation about the fact that, and, and you, you were humble about it, you said you, you didn't want to you know, make it into a big deal or whatever, but you know, that, that a, a component of your capability came from your genetics, your, mm -hmm. you know, it was intrinsic. It was just within you. Were you looking at any of those gorillas then and thinking, well, actually, they, they can't all be the best? I mean, by definition, you can't have 30 guys who are the best, but, right. but, but, but they can, can take turns uh, in yeah. being the best. And, and back then, you could kind of, in your mind, rank order them. Okay, uh, you know, there were regulations about, uh, okay, as soon as you reach this period, you can be a flight lead. As soon as you reach this period of hours and time, you can be an IP. As soon as you reach, you can be a mission commander. Then you can be a flight commander. I didn't play by those rules. You know, you proved it to me. It was your turn. Your turn was not based on what was written in a book. It was written on, it was based on your performance. You know, we had four flights. And you, you would normally pick, not by rank, but the four, one, four of the best guys in the squadron that could motivate people to be um, flight commanders. Now, that was a big deal in the Air Force back then. You know, I had three Air Force guys and a Marine flight commander. And when I made McGill a flight commander, even the general, the wing commander at the time said, uh, are you sure? I mean, you're depriving somebody. I said, no, no, I'm not depriving anybody. I'm rewarding those who are making me the best as far as training their guys. And those flight commanders were in charge of training their guys. They had instructors that worked for them. They had flight leads that worked for them and they had wingmen that worked for them. And as long as those four flight commanders were following my direction and I could see that improvement. And when they found somebody that was weak, they were fixing it. That's fine. If they couldn't do it, because it's not my job, I'd get a new one. You, you talked, Marco, in the last in our last call about the, the flight of four F4s that came back in with their brake shoot housings open and having departed. Yeah. Now, so now you're a squadron commander and you have to manage risk and you've got to place your trust in your flight commanders and your DO and, and you know, the other sort of, well, all, all, all of the players that are under your command. Um, what, what, is, what was your process then for not being overbearing for not becoming paranoid for not becoming a micromanager for not wanting to look at all the tapes to make sure people weren't going out doing stupid stuff I mean, maybe these are silly questions but i you know how do you how do you then balance the in desire my, for them in, to be the best in my office i could go back there and sit in my office and close the door all the way back at the other end of the 
building. And when the door was closed, it didn't have a little window in it. So you could look in and say, hey, can I come talk to you? And when the door was closed, everybody knew the door was closed. You know, everybody says, I have an open door policy until the door's closed. And when the door's closed, the door's closed. And I had a radio and I'd listen to them. I'd follow them through the freaks. I'd take a flight and I'd go, I'm worried about this particular. Let me, let me see what's going on out here. And I could tell by listening to them. And I'd sit in debriefs. You know, they'd come in and they'd go in to sit down and debrief and there'd be five of us sitting in there. <laughs> I'd say, all right, let me listen to what's, uh, what's going on here, you know. And, and that's how I did it. I didn't step in and override the flight lead or anything. I just sat in there as an observer. I want to hear what's going on, how we're going to fix this. You know, you happy with what you did today, you know? And so you just have to, you just have to make them want to be better than they are. And really, you know, you may reach a point where they just don't want to be. And then they, you can find other things for them to do. What was there? There are two status. There's you can be mission ready and you can be mission support back then. Mission ready, you're going to war. Mission support, you're going to ferry the airplane over for me. Which one you want? You know. Mission support, you're going to stay here at Eglin. Mission ready, you're going to go every time we go to Nellis. There is, so, there, there is though, presumably a place for those people. I mean, you, you need the gray sure. man, right? You, you can't oh, have yeah. everybody. Oh yeah, oh yeah. I mean, you need every, you need everybody. As long as they're contributing to the team, you need them all. But they might not be starters, you know. But it's not my job to walk down that hall and uh, try to make sure everybody is as good as everybody else in that squadron. That's not my job. My job is to give you the tools to train with. My flight commanders and my IPs and my flight leads, it's your job. You can leave your uh, attitude and you can leave your emotions and your feelings. You can leave them in your damn locker. Okay. Because it's, that's just not the way. I mean, you know, I, 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 I would tell them, I mean, you're over 21 and, and you're flying the F-15 because you're lucky. You went to flight school at the right time. You had the right IP. Uh, you probably did a good check ride. And so, and you got rewarded. You get to pick the F-15. If you're satisfied with just flying the F-15, go fly it somewhere. Don't fly it here. I mean, these people, the United States, they pay a lot of money for us to have these things. And it's our job not to be good, but be professional. This is your, I mean, this is your profession. This isn't your job. If you think flying a fighter in the Air Force is your job, go find another job. This is not a job. This is a profession. And as a professional, you need to be the best you can be. Now, in the back of my mind, I always knew. Okay, let's say we go out there and just have a massive midair or whatever. Yeah, okay, I'd get shit canned. Okay. But tomorrow, I'd still be the same. You know, I mean, I lost my job. In fact, the guy that spun our airplane in, that lost the one that we did lose, those helicopters, I rode with the helicopter guys out to the area, Rose Hill training area, to pick his ass up. I picked him up. He got on the helicopter. I hugged him because he jumped out. I was pissed that he didn't jump out earlier because he didn't jump out when he was supposed to. He delayed the ejection. He got on the airplane and he almost started crying and he looked at me and he said, I'm sorry that I cost you your job. And I went, dude, I, I don't care. What pisses me off is you ejected at 2,000 feet, not 5,000 feet, which was the reg. So we're good to go. <laughs> we're good to go. But he was upset at that. Isn't that sad? Hmm. How yeah. did how did you manage to avoid losing your job then? Oh, well, I was really lucky. Because there were a couple of times we got close. You know, I mean, there were a couple of um, uh, one more last chances. <laughs> like the DUI that <clears throat> when I wrote him up for a letter of reprimand instead of giving an article to Dean, you can't do double jeopardy. Mm -hmm. One more last chance mm -hmm. and things like that. But 
I think the I think those guys, to tell you the truth, in that squadron, both the enlisted and the officers, I think they said, we don't want to lose this guy. Let's knock this up. Mm -hmm. And, you know, every Friday we had, we had a $1,500 sound system in the, in the uh, gorilla bar. And we had a really cool bar and we had everybody to come over on Fridays and the wing commander would come over on Fridays. And I used to tell the guys, I would say, when the wing commander comes over here, I don't give a damn what you don't like about what's going on. He ain't the guy to talk to about it. You can talk to me about it. When he comes over here and he walks in and wants to have a beer with us and stuff like that, I'm going to nod at one of y'all. And when I do, you're his hand receipt. You make sure that people don't go over there and try to say, well, you, hey, you know that rule that you came out with? I'm like, uh-uh. No, that ain't the way it's going to work. Okay. You have his hand receipt. You get him a beer, ask him some questions like you care. You know, hey, what you what you used to fly before you came here? And what'd you fly this week? Did you have a good time? And this and that and this and that until he leaves. But don't, let's don't embarrass ourselves by just being stupid. You know, get out of control in the club at Nellis, fix it. Take him out, do something, but don't don't just let your rogues flounder, you know, because the first 06 that would come to me and tell me one of my guys needed a haircut, all you guys are getting haircuts. <laughs> don't, don't do that. Just don't do that. Police it yourself. If somebody's weak, fix it. And by weak, I mean all that. Just fix it. And it worked like a champ. Well, what's the journey then that you or that that, that that an eagle driver goes through then to get to the point where they're where you want them to be? Because you talked at the very end of our conversation last time about uh, taking everything off the jets, you know, no fuel tanks, um, presumably pylons, but but other than that, just clean. And they were going to start with one B one BFM, and and we know that it's a building block approach. You build in complexity and sophistication and challenge, presumably. Um, but but you've talked about large force exercises. You've talked about um, you know mission employment phases at, at Red Flag and that type of stuff. What's the uh, journey then to get somebody from where they are when you arrive to where you want them to be by the time they've gone to the desert? Well, you just you know it, it's like I said you you have to you have to let them be. Uh, you have to give them a little more, uh, make it a little harder each day, but you don't have to make it so hard once a day. You know, like you can't stay home and, and let's fly similar 2v2 intercepts and BFM and let's do that for five and a half months and then go to red flag where there are 200 airplanes out there at one time and your job is to escort and all that, when you haven't done it, you can't, you can't, you just can't do that, but they do. I mean, you know, and they embarrass the shit out of themselves and the community. They embarrass the F-15 community, they embarrass the F-16. They just embarrass themselves. You, you just can't do that. You have to give them the assets and, and the, the, uh, experience levels and uh, uh, trips to, to do that. You know, there were a lot of time. I mean, there were a lot of times when there were families, not families, but wives that would be pissed at me. Mm. We were gone so much. And I feel bad about that. As long as I was talking to them. But after that, I mean, all I want, you know, I wanted them not, you know, I told them, I, I, you know, I tell these guys every day, you know, tomorrow you could actually be flying against a real Soviet flown MiG who does, who wants nothing more than just to kill you. Hmm. And you have to be ready to kill him first. This, this isn't a game and it's not a job, you know, it's a profession and, and you just have to be, I'll never forget when we came back from Just Cause and we're sitting in Tampa in the BOQs and we had not been 
home for three or four days because we, when we were getting ready for Just Cause, we slept in the squadron and went out there and we just stayed there until we were going to give them, given our launch order. And when we were, when we were at McDill after the first night, uh, four of us were sitting at McDill and I told them the the DO said, you can call your wives and tell them where you're at and what you're doing. Just tell them you're okay. Okay. So we did that one at a time. Hey, you know, and so I remember the number four guy, he, he calls his wife and says, Hey, so-and-so, uh, I just want to let you know that, uh, we're at McDill and, and everything's good and all that type of shit. And he's going, well, uh, no, no, I mean, really we're at, and, and so he's trying to talk to her and he finally, he just goes, uh, Paco, uh, so-and-so, she, she wants to talk to you. And I get on the phone. And I go, Hey, how you doing? She goes, you worthless bastard. She said, I know you're not doing what you said. You've, you've got them guys at some strip club somewhere. Uh, and I'm going, no, no, this is what we really did. We, this is, you need to turn your TV on, you know, and, and see. And, and I think it was because I, I didn't, and, it, and one of my problems that I had back then, I didn't involve uh, the families more than I could have. Towards the end of my tour, I had a guy actually come to me, a flight commander, and say, I need to tell you that when we have going away parties and stuff, and you're saying goodbye to the guy, you're not recognizing the wife. You're not saying anything about the wife. And I said, well, okay, good point. And because I'm stupid, we had one. The next going away party we had, I said, you know, I want to apologize to all the bribes out there. But I, I don't mean to leave you out of this ceremony of saying goodbye to another best F-15 pilot who's moving on. But um, I, I didn't mean it to be that way. So I do want to include you in what we do. So what I have here is a ad from Public Supermarket. Hey, do you all know that the peanut butter is on sale this week? And uh, cereal, cereal's on sale this week. <laughs> As a joke, it didn't go over. <laughs> it didn't go over. And I never really was very close to them. But after the war, I've had many of them reach out to me and say, thank you. Mm. That I've seen at reunions and stuff. Mm. Thank you for doing what you did because they all came home. I said, I said, well, I mean, you may not have liked me back then, but I was not on a, I wasn't going to ask you to go to the prom. I only cared about these guys. Mm. And so that's all I cared about. I think, I don't know why, but I always had that premonition. I thought it'd be while I was there, but I always had that premonition. That we were going to do it. <laughs> and then when I left, I didn't get my full two years. When I left after a year and a half, because I told them when I got there, I got two years, mm. but I always had that, that premonition that we don't make this happen. But when I left, uh, I said, damn it. And then they left. I, I, I just said, okay, it's your turn. And they were, you know, I can't think of one that didn't do a 110%. I mean, it was just phenomenal. It really was. Do you, do you dream about that? Is, is it? Oh, every day. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And the things that will remind me of it, you know, I'll be out running or on the treadmill running or working out or something, or I'll hear a certain song on my playlist or something, you know, yeah. Or I'll think about, um, you know, something somebody says, you know, mm. and I think that's why I can recall so much about what we did more than they, because when we sit around and talk about it, they go, Oh, I forgot about that. Or I forgot about when you made us take our patch off. And I, but I, not me. I remember it all. Do, do you think that's a bit like parenting, though? Because you, you can, as a parent now, myself, and I, I can look at things I do for my children and think they probably won't remember any of this, but I'm doing it for them. And I can imagine in 20 years' time having a conversation and they would say, oh, yeah, I forgot about that. I didn't know about that. But, but it would still be sort of clear in my mind. So, yeah. so you were sort of a, a parent in a sense. Oh, yeah. You got 36 little kids, <laughs> you know. 
what, but what you have to realize they're all over 21. And so you have to ensure that they understand that you're over 21, mm. you know, you're a damn adult. So let's start acting like an adult. You know, I just, if you want to go to the, if you want to come to the bar and, and on a Friday night and tear our damn bar all to hell and throw glasses and all that, I, okay. But Saturday morning when I show up, cause I used to go in seven days a week cause on the weekends you could get shit done. I could go in, but when I come in here Saturday morning, shit better be right mm-hmm. or I'll shut it down. And that's the same way you have to deal with your kids. You know, my kids went through this, you know, how I was. And uh, there were times when we had issues, you know, a lot of issues and, and everything, but um, they come around. <laughs> Each one of them comes around at a different time, you know, in their age groups. And now they're grown adults with kids and everything. And now it's like, thank you, dad. Thank you, dad. Thank you, dad. But it was ugly for a while, you know. Your son, on, on, on the first time we talked for the, um, well, it wasn't the first time we talked, but it was the first time we, yes. we interviewed on this channel was um, with your Red Eagles uh, 500 MiG-21 sorties. He, yeah. he, he, he told me to ask you about your flower arranging. That's, oh, yeah. That's how now, he thinks see, Yeah. Now, that's that's my oldest son. He is, that's, that's my oldest son. And uh, we're very close, but there was a period of time when, and unfortunately, I told him about it. I said, you know what? I'm taking a class because we used to talk. I said, I'm taking a class on flower arranging. And he knew me as you know me, mm-hmm. not as flower arranging. And that's why he, see, he remembered it, but I didn't remember <laughs> taking a class on being arranging flowers. And that's why he called in. He said, oh, yeah? Well, let me tell you what he'd really like. He likes to arrange flowers. <laughs> you know speaking of of sort of trust then and, and your sort of children in inverted commas in the squadron mm-hmm. did they know what you had done in terms of your 4477th time and no okay at what point did you did you ever reveal that to them could yes. you ever you did uh, two two times in particular was uh, believe this uh, my dad passed away on September the 11th 1986 and the wing commander at the time uh, at Eglin would allow me to take an airplane to McDill and then I could drive over because my dad was in Winter Haven and he was terminally ill. And so I could go down there on the weekends. And I remember talking to, to uh, the wing commander at the time who ended up being a four star. And I said, you know, my dad uh, probably doesn't have a month or two left, but he has always asked what I used to do when I couldn't tell him. And he goes, tell him. So that was cool. You know, I got to sit down and talk to him about it. You know, he didn't have a clue what I was talking about. (laughs) And I got to talk to him about it, you (laughs) know, so that was cool. My kids, uh, they always asked, when you going to, even when they were getting older, my daddy did spy shit. He won't tell us what he did. When you gonna tell us? When you gonna tell us? And when you know how they finally found out? When you sent me the books. No. Yeah, when, I never told them. Even after the the interviews, when you sent me the books, and I told you how many I needed. I said I need five books. And you sent me seven books. I still have one. And so you signed them and all that stuff, and you sent them to me. And so I sent them to all these kids, and they get them. No way. And it wasn't two days later. Even my wife at the time, they're going, holy crap. And they're calling going, what, why didn't you tell him? And I'm going, because I couldn't talk about it, but I could talk to him. Well, yeah, but you talked to him before you told us. I said, well, it means more for you to see it in print than it does for me to just sit down and tell you. So they found out when I sent them your book. Wow. The first That's book. Incredible. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it was really cool. In fact, when I go see them, one lives in Charleston, one lives up in Columbus, Ohio, and one lives in Boulder, Colorado. When I go in and we sit around and watch TV and shit, it's sitting right there on the shelf. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. It's just sitting right there on the shelf. So now it's second nature to them. Yeah. Wow. Did you show them then? Have they seen the video 
the um uh, who, who was it brew baker and was it stooky i can't remember who did the video for you for your leaving Zettel. have they seen that video zettel and brew baker okay the fun brothers yeah uh, for my going away party yeah yeah did they, so oh yeah they've so seen they that seen okay. in fact uh you know because they couldn't go to those but once they were filmed and everything like that they would yeah they've seen it but again we don't say what it is yeah what I was actually doing. So they get to see all that stuff, which makes them go, gosh, what, what, what? I mean, what were you really doing? Why do you, you know, tell us what you're doing this, 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 this. And, this. and I just said, well, we, and they I, still, I, believe it or not, even my wife, they go, there's more to this story. I go, there's more to this story than what you know. That's all it is. It's, it's old news now. And they go, no, there's more. You're going to tell us someday. I go, yeah, whatever. Okay, I went to the moon. That's what I tell them now. <laughs> I went to the moon. <laughs> I should say, for, for everyone listening at home wondering what the hell we're talking about, so so that when, when Paco left the 4477th Red Eagles, so Z-Man and uh, Brubaker then put this video together, and it's it's mostly of secret, secretly recorded shots of Paco doing yeah. things like twizzling his hair and it's taking the mickey out of Parker for uh, you know his yeah. his desire to be Mr. Olymp- Olympus and and shit. And yeah. Ma- yeah. Maybe one day you'll let me have a copy of that that I can um I'll bring you a copy to the reunion. You will? Okay. And you'll let yeah. me put it on the channel? Oh, you can have it. Yeah, okay, sure. awesome. It's cuz it's it's a good video. It's it's funny. Yeah. Um okay. Look, we are uh, by my own admission now running over with where I said I would I try and get yeah. to in terms of 45 minutes yeah. but can I ask you some questions from our community then is sure. that right Parker so there's not too many um but we do have a patreon uh, sorry not a patreon we do have a discord server where people can come along and ask questions if you're listening to this and think well next interview I do or Steve does I'd like to ask some questions then come along to discord and pop your questions there so it's only a handful of questions, and there might be some repetition with what you talked about first time around, yeah, Parker. Yeah. So, so you know, be as brief or as verbose as you want to be. First question is from yeah. Pyro, who's actually an F one eleven guy, um, and he asks of the F fifteen models that you flew. I guess he's saying A through through D. Uh, what would oh you threw the E actually as well, didn't you? Yeah, so A through E. What would be the top three differences between the least capable and the most capable? That's part one of his question. Okay, real quick, the A model was the least capable. Pratt & Whitney F-100 motor, very undependable. Uh, New technology, slapped an afterburner on a fan engine. God said, I'm not sure that's going to work. But uh, the engineer said, well, I think it will. But we had a lot of problems with it. I mean, a lot of problems with it, you know. Uh, All the way until the best airplane I flew was the, obviously, the missive F-15 towards the end and the E model, tell you the truth, other than the fact that it had a bunch of bombs and shit on it. But the A model, or the C model missive airplane had Pratt & Whitney 229s, which were trust you can trust. I mean, good God almighty, they figured out how to do it. So the C model missive, no match, no match none whatsoever in avionics and in uh engine technology i enjoyed the e model for the short period of time that i flew it only flew it for a year i wouldn't want to fly it anymore but i enjoyed learning the mission and so that was that was okay but it was not an airplane i would not have you know just it just wasn't my thing well because because of the fact it was dual role multi-role or no, because you, night, you had somebody uh, in the back. It was a night bomb dropper. You know, it just, mm. I had never, you know, I, you know, I go 17 years without dropping a bomb. And then all of a sudden I'm riding around with a lieutenant in the front seat in the middle of the night at 300 feet on TFR. And he's excited. And I'm going, uh, this isn't very damn exciting to me, you know, by myself dropping a bomb. It just, it's just not, it just wasn't my thing. Nothing against him. Just, mm. Wasn't my thing. Hmm. Yeah. So, second part of his question, then, Paco, is um, could you have made any suggestions if someone had asked you to help design a helmet mounted display? Uh, back then, no. We had no, I had no concept about that type of stuff. I mean, um, Heads up displays and what was on those displays was about the farthest we ever went with Wayne Waller, our tech rep who, who, who would write software. 
uh, I mean, that was a dramatic jump from what we had in the F4, which was just a red reticle, you know. So a heads up display and and switchology was a you didn't think it could get any better than than what that was, what that was, you know. So as far as heads up to our um, helmet mounted displays and all that. I mean, hell, we used to take our helmets and modify them to make them lighter and lighter, not heavier and heavier. You know, we take the visors off of them and drill out holes in them and take the stuff out of the inside of them and stuff like that. You know, really? when I flew the MiGs, I, I flew with a leather helmet, <laughs> a World War II leather, World War II leather helmet because it was even lighter. You know, and plus I could move around and not hit the canopy with my helmet. Hmm. So it, I, I had no, um, I had, I didn't even know what a helmet mounted uh, thing would be. Okay. You know, it, it, it shocks me that the F-35 has a helmet that weighs 40 pounds or something. I'm going, damn, but I guess it works for him. If it works for him, I'm happy for him. Hmm. They're probably Back when awesome. I Back when I was in, mm -mm, wouldn't have worked for me. I think uh, probably they do a very limited amount in comparison of high G maneuvering as well. I mean, the idea yeah. behind that thing is you yeah, shoot. It, it, it's you it's got be to be, yeah, it's got to be a different arena than the arena I came from. Mm. So Sedlo asks about uh, the lessons you learned as an instructor at weapons school and um, how you took those lessons and you created training objectives and plans when you were uh, uh, taking over at the gorillas. So, I mean, he's raising a good question, actually, saying he, he would imagine you couldn't teach line pilots as in-depth as you would be able to teach uh, no. a weapons school student. So what what lessons did you learn that you could take with you, and, and, and where was the balance then? I took, uh, I always had the syllabus, weapons school syllabus. And I would take and chop, uh, objectives, mission objectives, BFM object, uh, objectives. You know, what, what do we want to see from a guy that's offensive? What do we want to see a guy that's defensive? What do we want to see from a guy that's neutral? In the weapon school, it may say student criteria, 1v1 uh, neutral has to gain an advantage. I would say, mm, he's you know, that guy's got 500 plus, maybe 700 hours, been in the airplane four or five years. Uh, what I want to see neutral is him to stay neutral. And I'll train him to stay neutral until the bandit makes a mistake and allows you to become offensive. And uh, one of my biggie was uh, I didn't like long, drawn out 1v1 engagements. Meet it, meet in a you know, meet an objective, stop, step back and do it. It's like blocking and tackling. I'm gonna run a quick running play to a tag, and then we're gonna do it again. We're just gonna keep doing it again until it just gets better and better and better. But I always had the weapon school syllabus with me. I just chopped the requirements, the objectives. And I was I was extremely uh, harsh towards objectives. I want them written on the board. What 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 this kid is a what what what's he going to do today? These are your milestones. These are your objectives. When you reach that objective, we're going to stop and we're going to start over again. Period. It's just we're not going to invent shit. We're just going to do and walk. So. so Tacking on to that theme then, Sedler also asked whether or not there were, and you may have kind of already answered this in the last conversation, but whether or not there was resistance from within the squadron or the wing as to any new techniques or tactics or teaching styles that you brought with you. No, I didn't do anything. Uh, 3-1, was it, uh, which was the Air Force Manual 3-1 for the F, and there was an F-15 uh, chapter of it that was written by members from all over the TAF would be brought in from USAFE and everybody. And we would, you know, it, it was a three dash one review as a tactics manual. Um, no inventing, no inventing. Uh, that was our playbook. Don't be coming up with weird ass bullshit. You know, 
uh, stuff other than what's in there. That's what's approved. Refine it, and we will refine it in 3-1. And, and just real quick, when we lost our airplane and it went out of control and went into a spin, even though the airplane turned out to be an, uh, an aircraft issue and not a pilot issue, um, I had a uh, three-star call me one day who he and I talked a lot anyway, but he called one day and, and when, when uh, this accident happened and he goes, what the hell was so-and-so doing when he lost that airplane? I said, I, he was doing probably close to a hundred knots. He goes, what was he doing with the airplane when he lost it? And I said, what he was doing was idle tactics. And, 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 and I went into a, a explanation of what he was doing. He goes, what the hell is he doing that for? And I went, check your 3-1. He's doing exactly what 3-1 said. So he goes and checks it and he goes, yeah, you're right. I said, yeah. So don't, you know, and, and that was our out. We would do exactly what it said and not expand on it. Do what it says to the best that you can do it. Hmm. So three dash one was our Bible. Uh, so Scotty is asking, he's got three questions. Um, because I think that, uh, when you, you listen to the slide interview, I know, I know you have, you, you told me you had, um, and slide talks about the fact that, you know, he, and you talk, you talked about it yourself in our last conversation that, you know, you, you'd avoided him a little bit. Um, you weren't keen on another Marine and, and then Sly talked about how, you know, you, this, this sort of guy sort of checks him into the wall and then walks into the office and, you know, so, so the Scotty's question is around how you deal with other type A personalities. Um, and I don't think this is just necessarily at the gorillas, but just over the years, how do you deal with other personalities who are maybe similar to you? I think, I think you just, uh, recognize that you both are like you are. You know, and there's a, you know, uh, here's an, you know, it, it was just, you just both recognize it. Now, one of the biggest eight personalities was Buffalo. And Buffalo knew that I was one of the biggest eight personalities. And we were great buddies until he started drinking. <laughs> okay, as soon as Buffalo started drinking, he became a bigger A personality than I became. And all he wanted to do was whip my ass. <laughs> and um, I knew that. So uh, I always was in a position where I could defend myself. And one of the, <laughs> one of the issues, I mean, an example, there were three urinals in the old club, the old original old club at Nellis. I walk in the urinal and there's a young lieutenant using one. Buffalo is using the other one and I walk to the middle one. And I look to my left at this lieutenant. I'd never seen him before. He was like cross country. And, How you doing? He goes, oh, good. <laughs> I look at Buffalo and I look down and I go, damn, you call that a dick? And he jumps back and grabs me and I push him into the stall because he can't swing at me in the stall. Buffalo's too big. So I'm in this, this kid. All he screams is, oh, hell, and runs out the door. Of the room. So, you know, you handled them one on one as you handled anybody else. You gave each other shit, but you respected each other. But you knew you knew how how it could go. You knew how it could go. You showed each other just mutual respect. Didn't you 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 later developed a routine for that, didn't you? Didn't you? Oh yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. 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 I mean, anytime Buffalo was around, if he had a drink in his hand, I looked for where could I push this son of a bitch <laughs> to keep him from just beating the living dog shit out of me? Because that's what he wanted to do as a friend. You know, and I go see him in Alaska and stuff, but yeah, he just, you know, he's got to, he's got to want to do that, you know. <laughs> um, second question from Scotty and the penultimate question, one more left after this then. So 
Um, he's curious about the process of making up a syllabus for a new aircraft that you don't know much about. So when the you know the Eagle comes off the production line, you don't know much about it. Um, how do you develop tactics? How do you figure out how to fight with it? And um, you know what was he's asking? What was the initial hardship? I'm, I suppose he's asking what was most challenging in that. When when we first got the thing, uh, like like the missive, he's talking about the missive F-15 one, obviously. I think when we first got it. And, and, and what are we going to do with it? Um, not knowing what it can do or what it's supposed to do, McDonnell Douglas stepped up and gave us simulators in the middle of the night. And from those simulators, as far as this is what it's supposed to do, if it's correct, and then you turn those into training scenarios or training missions, even though they're similar, uh, you turn those into scenarios that you can fly to one, ensure that what they're said it'll do, it'll do. And two, that, uh, okay, this starts to work. And then you move into, you know, there were guys in the squadron, believe it or not, who were new, who were becoming, uh, trying to become mission ready, going through initial training, you know, like let's say somebody like Rico or, uh, Roto, Till, or somebody like that comes into the unit, they go through what's called mission-ready training just to bring you up to mission-ready status in a uh, F-15. And after a period of time, you would then become mission-ready in the MISIP F-15 because in MISIP at the time, you could go out and start a regular F-15 that we had, and it was just a normal F-15. Uh, you turn it into a MISIP F-15 with a data transfer module that you plugged in, and it became a different airplane. Mm. And that's how you did it. MISIP, MISIP airplanes weren't just given to you with all the capabilities it had. It, it had capabilities that you had to tell the airplane, this is what I want. And and, and that was through the mission planning software then, wasn't it? So you would you'd put right. certain inputs into it and then, yeah, okay. Right. Uh, and then final question then, Paco, is is um, a great one. So Scotty mentions that the uh, Air Force has just closed down the uh, the final class of the weapons instructors for the F-15 and wonders whether you could reflect, based on your experience, um, what were the most valuable lessons and what would you highlight about the F-15? Um, and the instructors that you, you worked with in terms of, I suppose, what, what was... You know, it was sad. It closed on the December the 11th, 19, uh, last year, 2021. 45 years. Been open 45 years. Longest weapon school of any of them. And when we heard that it was going to be closing, a lot of us that were back in the early days when it first started, we were going, hey, you know, it's going to be cool. You know, we're going to go to Nellis, We'll have a weekend. We're going to see it. Fly its last hop. We're going to meet the class. You know, we're going to go through the F-15 division of the new Taj Mahal out there, the F-15 schoolhouse and all this kind of stuff. And they're going to see the old timers and we're going to talk and everything. It wasn't that way. What happened? They had a three-hour cocktail party at the MGM Grand or Caesar's Palace. Nine o'clock to 12 o'clock, midnight. Uh, it was gonna be an open bar with a little bit of uh, heavy hors d'oeuvres. And uh, if anybody's got anything to say, they can talk about it, but uh, uh, that's gonna be it. Why did they do go. that? I didn't go. And, and the bros, Buffalo, Stu, all of us that were back then. It deserved more for us to say this schoolhouse uh, trained over a thousand guys to be F-15 weapon school instructors that totally influenced the entire F-15 community. Mm -hmm. And uh, those people that were out there now, can you imagine for us to sit down and say, well, what's your syllabus like? What are you doing? Sit back in there. Like, you know, what do you do? What do you show me something? You know, well, here's hell. This is what we used to do. We used to do a one B one B one plus mini uh, night BFM hop. 
you know, until one of our guys plowed into a damn mountain and then that stopped. And we used to go after the SR-71 and, and we used to do live missile shoots. We go to Point Magoo and shoot the Great White Hope and A-9s and all that kind of stuff. I mean, what do you all, you know, no. Nah. And uh, nothing against them. I don't know them. I don't know any of them. They weren't even alive. They weren't born when I was in the F-15 weapons school. But the F-15 weapons school deserved more than that. It's 45 years. So. Do you think, it, uh, uh, do, if, if you had to guess, do you, would you think that's a, a money thing? Is that a, an operational tempo thing? Uh, I, you know, they need to get a, a jog on and move, move out to do the F-22 stuff. I mean, what, they don't care about the past. Uh, yeah. Uh, I, I think, uh, Personal opinion, we didn't have anything to, to close it down because uh, uh, probably a different Air Force. That's all you can say. It's no different than when we used to sit around with World War II guys and bullshit with the and nah, 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 nah. You know, well, we couldn't, you know, damn, that was pretty cool. We can't do that now. Well, I'm sure they uh, probably weren't allowed to have, you know, 50 or 60 previous instructors show up and have a Friday night beer call. And, you know, the graduations when I was there was a lot different. The graduations now were, uh, remember, it's not USAF Fighter Weapons School, it's USAF Weapons School. Mm -hmm. So their graduations are formal, they have mess dress, they have big ceremonies and stuff. I don't know. Mm -hmm. So maybe they just, uh, you know, I don't know. The final bit, Paco, of, of the questions from Scotty was whether or not at the time you knew the F-15 was going to build the formidable reputation that it would go on to build, that it would be the world's greatest air superiority fighter. Did I you know think that? we did. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, you always thought you did. You always thought that, yeah, it was going to be. But the first time we really felt like, you know what, this son bitch is going to be mean was when the Israelis used and then just I mean it just butt ugly slapped the shit out of them you know we went you know what and you know I'll tell you just a real quick funny story but uh, I think it was like in 81 80 or 81 I made a Christmas card we used to send Christmas cards back during Christmas I was born on Christmas day you know and everybody celebrates my birthday with you know lights and everything I don't know why but they do but I sent, we used to send Christmas cards. Every squadron in the Air Force used to send a Christmas card to the other squadron. You know, Merry Christmas from the 363rd, da, 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 you know, and you get all these Christmas cards. So I make a Christmas card. I said, let's make a Christmas card for the 433rd TAC 5 squadron. And it's a, a sleigh with a Santa Claus looking guy wearing a Soviet flight suit and it's got six reindeer kind of out in front turning and out the ass of the reindeer, it says Merry Christmas coming out of it. And the acting commander at the time, who was not teenage, it was our other guy, he goes, uh, I said, let's send this son bitch to a Soviet squadron. And he goes, yeah, that's probably a pretty good idea. And I said, okay, uh, I guess the easiest thing to do is just address all these Christmas cards to the Russian embassy in Washington. So we address all these Christmas cards, six of them, to saying, hey, you know, send these to your shitheads over there. They all came back. <laughs> they all came back along with um, people coming to talk to us. <laughs> what are you trying to do here? I'm just trying to wish these dumbasses, you know, Merry Christmas. Because it was the sleigh, six reindeer, but in the background was the silhouette, nose on of two F-15s coming at them with great white hopes coming off the bottom. <laughs> and all it said was Merry Christmas. Hope to see you pretty soon, <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah, the Christmas card. The infamous Christmas card. You got a copy of it? No. no. I just exactly remember what it was like when we sent it. <laughs> you following uh, 
This is this is this is the last question. Are you following yeah. what's happening in Ukraine? Uh, I watch it on the news. But you're not sort of looking at militarily. You're not really sort of sitting down looking at what the VKS, the the Russian air force or the Russian naval forces are doing. Or anything like that. Okay. No, I. Um, you know, I you know it's been so long ago, and it's so far above my pay grade. And you know, I bailed when I was in 06 and said, you know, if I go any farther, they're just going to take me out of the cockpit. And what they don't want is for me to be on CNN someday answering questions. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's time for me to move on. Mm -hmm. The only thing that I, uh, in my mind, thought of was I said, when I saw Poland with their MiG-29s and Ukraine started off with 60 and now they're down to like 22 and they don't have the people to fly them and everything. All I said to myself, and I remember talking to my daughter because she asked me, she goes, what do you think they did with all them airplanes? I said, just as a guessing man, I think we bought them. <laughs> so I think every one of them that's gone that they can't account for, they're somewhere and we're flying them and having a good time with them, just like we do with them old ass big 21s and floggers. I mean, that's all I think about is we got them somewhere. <laughs> Well, look, Paco, uh, thank you once again for your time, uh, for the third time. Thank you for your time. Really appreciate it. We're going to have to figure out the topic for our next interview. But we'll do Anytime that. Anytime you we, want to talk. We'll do that when we get together in November for the Red Eagles reunion. Um, so, but thank you so much for your time. Thanks for your patience and your, your generosity in sharing these stories and your experiences with us. I hope everybody watches and has a good time with them. They better. And they better like it as well, as in do the yeah. thumbs up in YouTube and leave a comment. If they don't, piss on them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thanks for tuning in to 10 percent true i hope you enjoyed this episode feel free to subscribe and if you're on youtube hit the bell button to make sure you get notified of the next episode thanks and take care